when is that? Great. Um, do you need to share your slides or something? Or yes, I do. Um, share the screen. Can you see my screen? Yep. Okay. Um. Well. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Stefan Lenoir um, from the University of Kent, who will be talking about derivations of quantum algebras. Thank you, Luca. Um, well, first, uh, thanks uh, to the organizers for, for this invitation to give this uh, talk online. Uh, not necessarily my favorite media, but I'm sure I can do something about that. And Luca, well done for saying my name uh, right. <laughs> Um, all right, so I'd like to um, to report on joint work with uh, in progress, I should say, with Samuel Lopes and uh, and Isaac Copong, and it's about derivation of some quantum algebra. So um, the quantum algebra I will be discussing are mainly uh, positive part of quantized enveloping algebras. So they are, they are interesting because uh, because they appear as certain quantum Schubert cells or quantum flag varieties. And the idea is to try to construct invariance as much as possible for these kind of objects. Um, the target being to attack some uh, some more difficult object, maybe like positroid varieties or quantum positroid varieties, etc. Um, but um, we we started working and discussing these kind of things with with Sam uh, fifteen years ago, uh, maybe maybe a bit longer than that, um, and. The idea was that we were trying to compute automorphism of these algebras, and uh, we'll go through that in a moment and we explain what uh, what was the problem at the time and, and uh, how it's been solved. Um, but then we, well, more, a few years ago, we started discussing again these derivations because we think that there is a natural conjecture and then we should be able to, to do something about it. Right. So uh, I will start by, discuss, by introducing the objects I want to discuss. Uh, basically, the quantized number of enveloping algebra I'm interested in. We try to develop the tools we, we need to study the derivation. We state the uh, sorry, Stefan, can I just interrupt for one moment? Um, the camera on the bottom left of your uh, slides is visible to everyone, and it's just blocking a bit of the slide. Uh, okay, so that's, oop. <laughs> sorry, I pressed the wrong button. I should not have pressed that. Um, so stop share. I, I'll share again. I, I see. Um, no, you don't want to see my email. You want to see this, and I need to get rid of you, Luca. So I don't know how I'm doing this. Um, is that better? Yeah, yeah, that's better. Yeah, okay, good. Right, so um, let's start with the object. So um, I will uh, I will use basically G as a as a simple algebra, simple algebra, and W will be its uh, its value group. Okay, uh, I will use A I J for the Cartan matrix, uh, and then my simple roots will be denoted by alpha one alpha n, Whoop. and I will use the following notation for uh, convention for my field. So K will be my field and Q uh, will be my deformation parameter. And it will be always a non root of unity. Okay, it's very important because I will use that in many, many places without actually specifying that I'm using this assumption. Okay, so attached to this data, each time you have a value group element, you can write a radius decomposition as a product of simple reflection. And if you do that in a radius way, then you get the notion of length for your um, for your value group element. So here I take a radius element, and if this is a radius, I can simplify it more and reduce the length here. It will be of length t, and the length that can occur for any element is between zero and the number of positive roots for your uh, system. So your root system. So here in this case, I will denote that by capital N. Right, so and you can use a radius decomposition of the of, to produce a set of uh, of positive roots of your of your system. So you start with a, a, a simple root, which is corresponding to this. Um, uh, 
elements here. Then the second one, you, have, you start with the decomposition of W, you start with SI1, SI2, and you apply SI1 to alpha I2, and that produces a second root, which is actually a positive root. And you can carry on like this using the decomposition of W to obtain uh, here if the length of W is T, T positive roots of, of, your, of your system. And uh, it turns out that uh, uh, it, it could look like the, um, the root you obtain, beta one, beta t, are dependent on the reduced decomposition you're choosing, but actually they are not. They only depend on the w, not on the reduced decomposition of the w you're choosing. Okay, so um, you got this uh, value group action on, on, the, on the root system. And when uh, why is that relevant here? It's because in a moment I will introduce uh, quantum groups or quantum bumping algebra, and the idea was to, of Lustig was to introduce similar type of action on this, this algebra to construct more uh, elements of this algebra. So let me be a bit more specific and remind you what the context of bumping algebra of G is. So uh, it's just a, the algebra generated by a bunch of elements, so E1, En, where N is the rank of your algebra, and F1, Fn, and the torus element, so K1, uh, Kn, and their inverses, satisfying a bunch of relations. So I'm not going to deep to uh, deep, to dive too deep into this uh, this relation. Let's just say the Ks are nice; they can commute with everything. Um, the E's and the F are, are related by this uh, this uh, relation here. Uh, so mostly they commute. Uh, except when they have, they have the same index, in which case uh, the commutator is equal to something in the uh, a polymer in the case and inverses. And maybe the most interesting part, it comes from the uh, quantum cell relation, which are just the formation of the usual cell relation, where you've got this relation between uh, two different uh, E vectors, so two different vectors corresponding to the simple roots. And similarly for the F. So I've not specified that here, but um, this uh, this uh, coefficient here are the quantum binomial coefficients. So we don't really need to know what they are for this talk, but they are just polynomial in Q basically. Um, okay, so that's the point I don't for ping algebra. This is a nice algebra. This is actually a up algebra, and. It, where the EI is degree alpha i and the degree of fi is minus case is uh, in the classical case and uh, is and uh, the subject about generated by the e's and the f are kind of the positive important and negative important part if you want so of this algebra, which is the sub-algebra generated by the E's. So actually, I didn't really need to introduce a, a full quantized dropping algebra. I could just have said this is the algebra generated by E1, En, and the quantum cell relation uh, between the E uh, um, generators. Well, it's easier to do that this way. And why is that the case? Because uh, because of the way uh, Lustig defined is, uh, its byte group action on the quantized enveloping algebra. It defined it on the, on the full quantized enveloping algebra. Uh, so this is an analog of what of the construction we've seen earlier of the positive roots. So what uh, Lustig did is define um, automorphism of this algebra UQG. Uh, that it is not by TI, and each TI corresponds to uh, a simple root, uh, alpha i. And each time you have a reduced decomposition of an element of the value group, then you can construct a bunch of elements uh, which are very nice. So the first one using the E vectors, the E generators, and the automorphism TI. So you, con you mimic the construction of the positive roots, except that you replace the simple affection by this automorphism, and you apply them not to the simple roots, but instead you apply them to the corresponding uh, E generators. And if you do that, you get a bunch of vectors that have called uh, X uh, something. So for instance, the X beta two, what is X beta two? So uh, in that case, beta two for me would be S of I one alpha of I two. So that's a classical construction and uh, loose constructor uh, using isotomorphism, 
a vector, an element, x beta 2, which is defined like this. And this element will always belong to the positive part of the quantile enveloping algebra. And it's a very nice element. Uh, it's actually only of the group beta i when you uh, um, grade uh, this algebra by the uh, root lattice. All right. So what we are interested in is, uh, is, uh, is the algebra generated by these x vectors. So you fix a w, fix a radius decomposition, then you get x beta 1, x beta t. What can you say about that? You get a, a, a subalgebra of uq plus, but it's not any subalgebra. It's, uh, it's a subalgebra that I will denote by uh, uqw, okay? And it only depends on w, not on the chosen uh, radius decomposition. So similarly, similar to the case of, uh, of uh, action of the value group on, on, on positive roots. Uh, moreover, you can prove that uh, a PBW uh, theorem here, which is that uh, the uh, monomials in the X betas taken in this order form a basis for uh, the algebra UQW viewed as a vector space of that K. Right. And finally, we have a good control on the, on the commutation relation between these uh, X vectors, these X uh, indeterminates. Namely, uh, if you take two betas or two, two indices and you want to know how to straighten this, you need to rewrite it in the PBW basis. So here I'm assuming J is bigger than I. So I should be re re able to rewrite it as monomial uh, in the correct ordering and you can. Uh, and you get an expression like this, where you start with the same element but straightened. Uh, the cost is just you have to multiply by Q to the something. And then some, a sum of more complicating stuff appear. But here you see the, the fact that you've got a convex ordering on the, on the, on the positive roots uh, appearing. Why? Because uh, the elements you're seeing appear First of all, all the beta i plus one, beta j minus one that occur are stuck between beta i and beta j. So you already, you only, uh, only roots which are positive roots which are in between beta i and beta j intervenes, and they have to satisfy an homogeneity condition, which is this condition here. Yeah. Okay, and that's very nice because these two conditions together allows you to present this algebra as a, a skew polymer extend, uh, ring, that is an, as an iterated or extension starting from the base field and adding a, a non-commutative variable uh, one at a time, a bit like you're doing for a polynomial algebra. So it's a, it's a, it becomes a very nice uh, non-commutative polynomial ring in some sense. And finally, let me point out that when you choose w to, uh, w to be the longest element of the value group, so W0, then the algebra you get, the UQW you get, is nothing but the positive part of your contrast enveloping algebra. Actually, I will focus very much on that case in this talk. So this is mainly the case where we can do stuff. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the algebra. So if you're uh, unfamiliar with this, uh, I'm probably going too fast, but um, that's, uh, I can give you an example to try to see what's going on a bit better. Uh, my, no, that's okay. Um, right, so if you look at the B2 case, which is a case of G being SO5, um, then we have two simple roots, uh, let's say alpha and beta, where beta is the longest one. And you've got two generators, so I've not called them E1 and E2, but E1 and E4, and we'll see uh, well, a moment, in a moment why I've done that. Oh, um, and I forgot to change everything, so sorry, it should be an E2 then. Um, and this uh, quantum cell relation, um, so these are the expression we get. So if you set Q equals one, you retrieve the usual uh, cell relation for the Shirley generators of the positive part of the envelope algebra of type B2. And um, you can present that as, a, as an iterated or extension in four steps by introducing the, the, uh, the element X that we can construct through the Lustig automorphism. In that case, um, this uh, X's satisfy 
uh, the relations that are here. So if you want to know, to know exactly what they are, this X is, well, um, X1 is probably equal to uh, E1. Uh, the X2, the X4 is probably equal to, so that's E1. I think this is E2. And then uh, uh, this will tell you what uh, X2 is in terms of E1 and E2. And once you know that, uh, that with this uh, relation will tell you what X3 is in terms of E1 and E2. But we don't really want to work with E1 and E2. We prefer to work with this set of generator X because it's uh, it looks more like polynomial ring and the commutation relation are um, easier to handle in that case. So that's uh, that's the main example I will I will be considering um, in this in this uh, in this talk. Okay, so um, right, uh, twenty years ago, uh, so I was a, uh, I was a PhD student at the time, and then um, I I went to uh, by François Dumas, and he presented a, a conjecture about the automorphism group of this uh, of this algebra uh, of the positive part of quantized enveloping algebra. Which says, uh, sorry, it should not be C, it should be a K, that uh, automorphism group actually should be quite small, um, which might be kind of obvious because of what we know now, but it's not completely trivial if you know the classical case. So it's where you see that quantization kind of uh, implies rigidity in some, in some ways, because um, the automorphism group becomes almost just a, a, a very uh, ab well, small abelian group. That is, uh, it's just a semi-direct product of a torus of rank, the rank of the Liagebra uh, by the, automor the um, automorphism coming from the uh, Dinkin diagram of G. Okay, so it, it's, a, it's very small, actually. It's the smallest you can expect. And uh, in comparison, if you look at, uh, at the enveloping algebra of the Eisenberg algebra, it is known that you have wide automorphism for this algebra. So the automorphism group is much richer uh, for U of SL3 than for U uh, for U plus of SL3 than for U Q plus of SL3. And so um, it was uh, it was something that uh, uh, got me uh, interested. And um, the first few examples we had about this conjecture. Um, uh, pointed out to the to the fact that it could be uh, this would be true uh, in the A2 case. So for SL3, Aleph and Dumas did prove this conjecture in 1996. And they proved this conjecture uh, for B2 or SO5 in 2007. And in the SL4 case, we did prove that for with some uh, in 2007. Um, and then we we started. Uh, trying to develop more general tools, but uh, uh, we didn't succeed. And Yakimov did prove the full conjecture um, in, uh, in 2014 and prove that actually this is correct. There are no more automorphism than this. Right, so that was kind of the end of the, of the story um, for this automorphism group. But um, there is this, uh, this kind of idea I would not say this is our guiding principle that um, um, there is a strong link between derivation and automorphism. So often you are told that um, uh, you should hope that, hope, I think is a correct word, that your automorphism group is uh, would be an algebraic group, a nice algebraic group. And if this is the case, it has a Lie algebra and the Lie algebra associated to this algebraic group. And you hope that the Lie algebra you get for this automorphism group should be actually isomorphic to the algebra of, the, of derivation of your uh, starting algebra. Right, so this is more a guiding principle than anything else because it's not uh, always correct, uh, but there should be a strong link between uh, automorphism and derivation. So if this is the case here, we've got a nice uh, algebraic group. When you take the algebra of this algebraic group, so a finite part uh, coming from the automorphism of the diagram will disappear. And you should expect that the Lie algebra of this automorphism group is um, just um, uh, C to the uh, or K to the rank of uh, of uh, of G. So you will find a, a, a Lie algebra uh, of dimension n, or uh, being the rank of the of the of the Lie algebra you started with, a commutative one. So 
it's natural to think that uh, maybe this um, uh, you could describe actually the derivation of um, the the derivation of the positive part of uq plus of uq and maybe you should expect that uh, it's a free module over the center of rank the rank of your of your Lie algebra right so if you if you're familiar with quantum uh, quantum algebras one thing you can try to do to um, to approach this problem is to embed uh, your algebra into an algebra where you control the derivation and the algebra where we know derivations typically are quantum tori. And it's not very difficult to embed uh, this algebra into a, into a quantum torus. Why? Because we can use, for instance, a theory of deleting derivation of quotient to, to do that. But there are other strategies nowadays to do this. And why is that a good thing if you embed? Well, because if you embed, then um, and you embed in a way that uh, uh, you embed in something which is a localization, then you can always extend your derivation to this localization. Now you end up with a derivation of your bigger algebra, but maybe you have more control on what the derivation looks like at that level. And indeed, if you, if you can extend your derivation to a quantum torus, then you can use the result of Osborne and Passman that basically describes the derivation of, of quantum tori. So basically, it says that it's a sum of uh, a pseudo inner derivation and a central derivation. So central derivation is just a derivation that acts by multiplication by scalar on the denominators of the quantum torus. And pseudo derivation, uh, pseudo inner derivation, they are they would basically be inner derivation in the case if we use that. So I'm not going to um, to define that, but that, there is a subtlety here. Yeah. Right, so the problem when we try to use this directly is that we lost too much control from going to uh, the algebra we are interested in, that is uh, the UQ plus, to the quantum torus. Uh, there are several difficulties. So first of all, you're looking at uh, derivations, so you want to control them as module over the center. And uh, the problem is when you are localizing, you can, you can change the center quite a lot. So you don't even need the center to have the same cool dimension. The cool dimension can uh, move from, uh, let's say, one to n in some cases without any problem. So that's one of, one of the first uh, um, difficulty. Yes, you control a bit more how things look like, but you lose completely control on, on the center. And so that's, uh, that's something that uh, we, we could not handle very well. Um, uh, and the second difficulty was, uh, well, maybe the generators, uh, if you're thinking of using uh, deleting derivation, for instance, the generator of the quantum set of the quantum torus are not easily expressible necessarily in terms of the generators of, of the quantized engulfing algebra and vice versa. And that creates other difficulties. So you can't really export all of this to, to your advantage. So we had to use we decided to go for uh, the same type of embedding, but in a slightly different uh, in a slightly different. But before I do that, uh, I want to um, recall the result of Caldero about the center of of these algebras UQ uh, plus of G. So they are always polynomial algebras, commutative polynomial algebras. Uh, that's a, a result from 1995, and these algebras. Um, have uh, also a uh, few extra normal elements. So what is uh, usually you don't, uh, the center is not enough to control, uh, to, to get a good based on your algebra. Uh, what you need is to control normal elements really um, for various reasons. Uh, so what is a, a normal element? This is a, an element uh, whose left and right are these are the same, coincide. And I will denote by N of A, the subalgebra of an algebra A generated by its normal element. And it turns out that um, in many cases, uh, the set of normal elements and the set of, of um, central elements are the same uh, for UQ plus algebras. And uh, this is um, an equality if and only if G is of one of this type. Oh, that's not what I want to do. Um, is of one of this type. 
And in the other cases, at least type A, type D, when uh, Dn, when N is odd and E6, the normal elements, there are more normal elements than central elements. It's obvious that the central elements is normal. Right, so why do I recall this? It's because we can compute the derivation at the moment only in the, under the assumption that all normal elements are central. And that's uh, so only in the, in the cases where uh, G is of one of this type. Okay. Right. So the algebra UQ plus, I told you already, this is an iterator, the extension of those base fields, so it's an assigned domain. Uh, but it's it's even better than that. It's actually what we call a quantum omnipotent algebra. So um, so I can present it um, as an iterated or extension of this type. But the automorphism and skew derivation satisfy extra assumptions. So basically, the automorphism are kind of uh, degree well uh, linear automorphism with no degree no degree zero part. The, the skew derivation deltas are locally omnipotent that allows to apply various theories, uh, in particular deleting derivation, etc. And the sigma j are restriction of nice automorphism of of the of the the entire the full algebra R, not just of the subalgebra R k minus one. Okay, so I, I'm not going to enter into the, the details of this. It's just all this quantum omnipotent algebra Q and A's for short are very nice and they are been um, uh, extensively studied in the last uh, in the last ten years. Um, why is that the case? Because they, 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 all the UQW algebras are examples of, of QNAs, and these algebras play the role of, of Schubert cells in quantum flag varieties. So that's why we, they, we people really wanted to, to understand these objects. And in the last few, well, in the last 10 years, uh, Goodall and Ekimov in particular have, have spent a lot of time working on these algebras and uh, provided these algebras with. Uh, quantum cluster algebra structure. And basically uh, what we we'll use in the next few slides is try to uh, describe a bit the, the quantum cluster algebra structure, but without saying it. And I will actually just need to give you an initial quantum cluster for, for this algebra. But it's really the theory of quantum cluster algebra that, uh, that is uh, going on here. All right, so to describe that, I need to, um, to introduce the coloring of the roots. Uh, so what do I mean by that? So um, uh, we recall that I, I fixed a, a radius decomposition of my element W0 that will give me a, a presentation of uh, UQ plus as a quantum omnipotent algebra. And I have N uh, positive roots. And for this N positive roots, I will attach a simple rose. And how do I do that? Well, I will just basically think that I will send J so J appear here, um, so maybe I should write this as, why is that not working? Oh, sorry. So this is SI1, SI2, SIN. And I will look at uh, the J uh, factor here. And the J factor will have an index, which is an IJ, which is an element between one and N. Uh, and I will, uh, the map mu will send this j to this ij. Uh, so if we look at, uh, at double the, our running example, which is uq plus of b2, we have the uh, reduced decomposition of w0, which is s1, s2, s1, s2. And the coloring we get here, the coloring map, uh, is defined by mu3 and mu1 are equal to 1. Why? Because in position 1, oh, this pen is. In position one and three of this reduced decomposition, I've got a one, and in position two and four, I've got a two, so mu four and mu two are equal to two. So once we have this coloring map, I can define uh, predecessor maps and, uh, and successor maps. So um, the formal definition here, I will just uh, focus maybe on, on the predecessor. So if I fix uh, a number between one and capital M, so I want to look at which number before that has the same coloring as the number I'm looking at. So for instance, if I look at four, 
I want to look, uh, I know that mu4 is equal to two. I want to look at the previous number, so less than four, which has the same coloring, that is the same value for mu uh, as four, that is two. And it's in that case, it's very easy to see that uh, two is the predecessor of four. Of course, the first number which has a color has no predecessor. And so in that case, the predecessor is, is minus infinity. And we can define successor in the same way. Uh, for instance, uh, if I look at uh, uh, one, mu one is equal to one. So the successor of one will be the next integer such that mu of this integer is equal to one. And it's obviously three here because mu three is equal to one. And so I'm ending up with this equality here. And at some point, uh, there won't be any integer left afterwards, which has the same color. So if you have no successor, we say the successor is plus infinity. So we, we use this, uh, so you define this coloring map and from this, you get these two maps, predecessor and successor. So what are they good for? Well, because of a theorem of, of Gooder and Yakimov that constructs all the homogeneous prime elements of a quantum nilpotent algebra using maps like this. So what the theorem is saying is that you can find elements y1, yn that you can define recursively and satisfy this, uh, um, this commutation relation. So the CK is explicit, but we don't need um, actually this, uh, this, uh, this formula here. Uh, so these elements are, constructi are constructed recursively and they have the property that um, um, they define all, all the uh, prime homogeneous elements of your algebra. So prime means that they generate a prime ideal, they are normal, uh, etc. and homogeneous. So that's very, for the, for the grading I define in terms of, of, the, of the root lattice. So these elements are very nice and very important, these y vectors. Um, and they went even further. So this is nice. This explains what they were what they were looking for. But actually, as a corollary of all this, they could prove that um, so the y vectors are always in your algebra UQ plus. But not only and, and they Q commit between between them. So uh, all the difficulty of the of the relation of UQ plus between the X vectors have disappeared. The Y vectors are very nice, they just Q commutes. And the algebra R actually embeds inside the quantum torus associated to this uh, this quantum affine pace generated by the Y vector. A quantum affine space and a quantum torus. And that's exactly the situation we want to be in if you want to uh, um, construct a quantum, well, build a, con a cluster algebra structure on R. Why? Because if you want to be in that situation, you will start, you want to um, define an initial cluster, which is a set of Q-commuting variables, so that your algebra is inside the corresponding quantum torus, and then you will have to mutate all these things uh, and hope that your algebra R will become the quantum cluster algebra uh, you obtain by, by all this mutation. And that's it's exactly what is happening here. But I won't need the, the quantum cluster algebra structure, but just this, this embedding here, which uh, sandwich our algebra R between two nice algebras in which I can do computations, basically. Moreover, they control completely the, the subalgebra generated by the normal elements in the sense that the normal elements are basically generated by the, um, the Y generators, but the Y generators which have no successors. Okay, so basically this is this condition which is extremely important. So, and this subalgebra generated by the normal elements lives inside this, uh, this quantum of fine space. Okay. All right, so if we go back to, uh, to the UQ plus of B2 example. So we already looked at the coloring map, the predecessor and the successor, and we can write on explicitly um, the, the, um, the Y vector in that case, we can go through the computation using the explicit formula. That's a bit, well, it's not very difficult in that case. 
and you get this uh, this uh, this uh, tower of embedding. And the normal elements, uh, you are told the sub algebra generated by the normal elements. You are told it, it's a polynomial algebra generated by the k's, by the y's, uh, which have no successor. And if you just look here. Uh, two that have no successor are y3 and y3 and four, and so this is a polynomial algebra in y3 and y4. Actually, it's um, it's coincide with the center of this algebra uh, through uh, Calderon theorem. Okay, right. So uh, I'm not I don't I, I'm not going to make use of that really, but if you need more, uh, sometimes you might need more. Um, uh, initial cluster, and one way to do that is to use the fact that on, not only we have a quantum unit potent algebra, but we have a structure of, of symmetric quantum unit potent algebra, and so you can rewrite it in uh, as an iterated or extension this Euclid plus algebra in various different ways. And each time you are doing a different way, basically that will give you uh, a different uh, initial cluster and a different type of embedding. So sometimes having several of them allows you to play a bit and simplify some of the some of the computation but uh, it won't be apparent in this uh, in this talk right so um so i think i'm ready to basically state the main results and then uh, after that i will uh, spend a bit of time trying to uh, at least give you the the main uh, section of the proof so i will assume that uh, um, all normal elements are central and so the, uh, the subalgebra uh, generated by the normal elements coincide with the central elements. So it's type B, C, uh, D when N is even, um, G2, F4, E7, and E8. And in that case, we can describe the, the derivation explicitly. Every derivation is a sum of an inner derivation plus a, com uh, a combination over the, the center of this uh, uh, derivation uh, dk, so there are n of them, as many as we have uh, uh, simple roots. And I've described for you the effect of dk on the generators of uq plus. On the generators ei, it acts by, um, so this is a Kronecker symbol. So this is one when i is equal to k and zero otherwise. And so it acts on ei by zero unless i is equal to k, in which case dk of ek is equal to k. So you have very, very few uh, derivation. Actually, you retrieve what you were expecting from, uh, from uh, uh, the well, Yakimov theorem about uh, the uh, androskevich tumor conjecture. OK, so how did we prove this? So it's, it's done in three steps. So um, we, instead of embedding into uh, any quantum tori, torus, we, we started by uh, taking a derivation of UQ plus, and we took advantage of this type of embedding. Uh, so here, R is embedded in a quantum torus, but as I said earlier, it's a, it's a bit too much. If I was to extend uh, my derivation D to this quantum torus, which is a localization of R, the center is changing too much. And so I will have to control that on top of everything else. So it's, it's a bit too much. So instead, you can um, define a smaller localization, which is nicer for, with this respect. So what do I mean by that? You can look at the multiplicative system generated by the YK, which have a successor. So the YK, which are not central. And it turns out this is, this is uh, generating an ORS set in both R and the underlying quantum affine space. And the good thing about this is that the two algebras, the two localization coincide. So, so that will be the algebra I call R at. So why is it a good thing? It's a good thing because the relation in R are very are difficult to handle. However, the relation in AQ, even if we localize it by a few of the Y, it's not difficult. It's just a space in which you have localized a few of the joint. So it, very easy to, to do computation with, using this uh, algebra. And so now we've got a, a better embedding. So we have embedded our quantum affine space inside R, inside this localization R at, and inside this quantum torus. And I will do the derivation step by step, basically. And 
So why are at? Well, the center, remember the center of my algebra R was a polynomial algebra in the YK, which have no successor. The problem is uh, if I had uh, extended my derivation to the big quantum of uh, torus, the center is much bigger. Huh? It's not much bigger in, that sense, in the sense that it's the same cool dimension, but I inverted a lot of elements in, uh, along the way. The localization R at is much better because its center is actually does coincide with the center of R. The reason being, I've localized all the Ys which are not uh, central. And so I've not introduced any additional central element by doing this localization. Okay, so that's that's really the step where we construct the, um, the intermediate algebra in which we can do a uh, computation. So now the idea is I've got this embedding here and I take a derivation of R and I will extend it to a derivation of, of this localization. You can always do that. And I need to control the derivation of, of this algebra R at, which is nothing but the localization of a quantum affine space at a bunch of variables, which are at all the variables which are not commutative. And so the second step of the proof is actually to compute the derivation of such partially localized quantum affine space, basically. And how do you do that? Well, now this partially uh, localized quantum affine space embedded in the quantum torus. And in that case, I can, because the computation and the link between the two is quite easy to, to handle, I can use those from Passman results. And I know I can extend um, the derivation of this R at algebra to the derivation of TQ. There, I know by the theorem of Osborne and Passman what they look like, but I have no change of generators. And so I can hope to, to control what's going on. All right, so it's easy to define a bunch of, of, uh, of derivation for this uh, uh, R at algebra. Oh, that should be capital wise. So um, just this DQ are derivation which act by multiplicative one on the yj by zero if j is different from k and by yk if uh, k equal to j. So it defines derivation in the same way as we were expecting. And you could expect these are the only ones, but it's not. And there is a bunch of other derivations that showed up. Uh, so Basically, for this partially localized uh, algebra, the derivation are sum of an inner derivation, a derivation coming from one of these DK, uh, and then we have uh, extra derivation, which come from uh, central elements, basically, uh, which can Hi, be expressed Stephane, as sorry. follows. Can I interrupt? Yeah. Um, there's a question in the Zoom chat. Um, someone's asking, what year was the Osborne Passman result? 1995. Okay. Um, so this derivation, for them, I mean, this proposition is not just a direct application of, of uh, Osborne and Passman. You need to work that out, right? It's, it's, uh, it's kind of classical techniques, I guess, we are using here. Um, so what are the derivations that occur, this, uh, this uh, DKJ? So each time you're fixing, so fix a K, which has uh, no successor. So the YK, corresponding to this is actually, um, or the yj corresponding to this is actually uh, uh, central. Now, you can choose an element, a central monomial, okay? So that's a central monomial. And but I, will, I will assume that it does not involve the central variable of, uh, I've, uh, I've chosen. So if my pen can work, I can say, so for instance, in the B2, uh, in the B2 case, okay, I could say if I want uh, K equals three, Y three is central, then I could take G to be any polynomial, any monomial in, uh, in, oh, sorry, we should not choose the same later. That's uh, not very good. Uh, in Y4, and I could choose something else. And, and then from this data, I can define a derivation, which I will call D3G, 
And what does this derivation do? It will send any variable y, which is not central to zero. And the central derivation will be all sent to zero, except yk, which will be sent to this g. So basically, I have derivations that uh, sends one of the uh, uh, central variable to a central monomial not involving this central variable. Okay, and that's the only derivation you can get, and that gives you a direct sum basically inner plus the sum of the decay plus this uh, this derivation here. Okay, so we we are we're in good shape. We managed to um, get this small localization. We managed to control the derivation at that level, and now um, we have we will have to to get back to R. But before, I mean, maybe this this direct sum is a bit of a pain to understand. Actually, you can express it in a much nicer way and just say the derivation yi, it uh, uh, sends a yi to something which is of this form. So as you see, this is you can see the inner derivation and the yi will be sent to a central element times yi if uh, yi is not central. And it's also sent to uh, alpha i plus y plus a beta i when i is central. And the beta i, in that case, this is one of this, this is a central element, which does not involve the y i variable involves. That's why its degree in y i has to be zero. OK, so it's not that complicated to, to see these derivations are quite explicit, and you can work with them. Right. OK, so step three. Um, so we have our derivation r. We have our derivation d of r. And now we have this. Uh, and larger algebra are at. Okay, so we have this situation here, and we know the derivation in, in this are at. So, what I would like to, to do is um, this my derivation d when I lift it to R at will look like this, and I have this element x appearing, and this x is an element of R at. So, the difficult part really is the, the, the difficulty here is to prove that the element x is actually not living in R at, but in x, in R. And the reason for this is because um, we started with, from a derivation of R. And the inner part, even when you lift it and see it as a derivation of R at, will have to be in R. It's, it's actually quite a, a difficult uh, thing to prove. So um, I think I have maybe five more minutes. Look, I, I don't know exactly what time I'm supposed to stop, but um uh yeah, I think you have ten minutes. Uh, okay. maybe a bit more time for questions, so maybe seven or eight minutes. Okay. All right. So in, in what remains of time, I will try to prove that uh, this X belongs to R and not not just R at. So how do we do this? So we will introduce smaller localization again that fits that fits between the algebra we control, so R at, and the algebra we are interested in R. And what are these localization? I will localize at all the Y's which are not central, except one. So to get R at, I was localizing at all the variables that were non-central. To get Fk, I will localize at all the variables that are not central, except one, the one corresponding with to the index I've chosen. Oh, that's not good. Um, which is k. Okay. So and that gives me that uh, allows me to define this Fk algebra. So if I start with a, with a derivation from R, it extends to the derivation of Fk and a derivation of R at. And this, this is a, a nice algebra because the center of R at and R are the same. It's not very difficult to see that the center of the algebra Fk is equal to the center of these two algebras. So I'm not, I, I don't have to worry about the center here at all. Uh, the center is all under control. Okay, so um, to prove that x is in R, I will need to prove that x is in Fk. That's, uh, that's the first step I, I, I need to do. So how do I do that? Uh, I will do that by constructing an element which is a very nice element uh, of R at. Uh, it's almost central, but not quite. So if I denote by Tk, the subalgebra of R at generated by the y I and the inverses, uh, 
corresponding to variables which are not central and different from k. Uh, quantum torus, unipartometer quantum torus. And how many, in how many variables? So um, we know that uh, we have n, y, but out of that, the center is a polymer of the degree n, of dimension n. And I've taken one of these variables. So that's why I get uh, this number of variables for my quantum torus. And it turns out that you can do that by inspection in, in every case that um, this number, the number of positive roots minus the number of simple roots is always an even number. In the case is I mean, and so when I do minus one, it's an odd number. And it's a, it's a known result that when you have a unit parameter quantum torus in an odd number of variables, it has to have a central element. So it's, a, it's, it's this element I'm, I'm very interested in. So, and I can choose it uh, onto the form uh, a, a monomial in the Ys that generate this quantum torus. So it's just a monomial in the Ys. So this element, uh, because it lives in a polymer algebra uh, and a long polymer algebra generated by the YI, which have no successor, which, which have a successor, it's not, it can't be a central element because the, centre, the center is a polymer algebra generated by the YI, which have no successors. And so this is not a central algebra of, uh, it's not a central element of R, nor of R hat. And it commutes with all the YI, uh, that, uh, which have a successor, except possibly, possibly YK. And it commutes with all the YI, which have no successor because they are central. And it's not in the center of R hat. So the only possibility is for this element not to commute with YK. And because this is a monomial in the in Ys, it has to Q commute with YK. And so what I get is that uh, it's an element Z which commutes every Y except one YK. Uh, it Q commutes with it with a, uh, an exponent which is non zero. Okay. So here there is a, an, we construct an element which will be key in the next step when we want to prove that X is, uh, is in R. Um, so it's an element we construct through all these kind of technicalities, an element that commutes with everything bar one of the variable, basically. Right, so now how do we use this element to, to, uh, to prove that X is in uh, FK? So FK, um, so I want to see R, as a module of a, a, a smaller subalgebra. So I will take BK to be the subalgebra generated by all the Ys and the inverses if they exist uh, except YK. And so our ad becomes a, a BK module, uh, a free BK module with this basis, uh, the exponent of YK. Right, so what we do is my X, which is an element of our ad, I will decompose it in this direction. And some of the exponents that will occur will be uh, non-negative. Some of the exponents for yk will be negative. So I decompose this uh, x into x plus and x minus according to the, uh, by distinguishing whether the, uh, this is a polynomial or purely Laurent polynomial part. So this, uh, where the, uh, all the exponents are non-negative, um, clearly belongs to fk, which is generated by a, by everything uh, except um, you, you, you allow for everything to have a negative exponent except X, uh, yk when you define fk. You have not localized that yk. And so this part is okay, it's, it's in fk. So to prove that x is in fk, you have to prove that this x minus element is in fk. And the way to do that is to uh, uh, use the fact that D restrict to uh, a derivation of FK. And because I have this special element Z, which is in FK, I will apply my derivation D to uh, powers of, of this element. And they all will belong to this um, FK algebra. Right. So remember, I told you what D is when I looked at it as a derivation of, um, of R hat, and we got formula like this. Now, our Z, it's a monomial in the Y, where, but Y only in this case. 
And so when I apply my derivation D to this Z, I will get that the inner part will act on Z, plus I will have a central element appearing, eta, times Z. And due to the form we have for the derivation of this partially localized um, uh, quantum affine space. Now I can use uh, all the rules of that derivation to prove that uh, uh, D uh, applied to ZI is uh, of this form. Uh, it's not very difficult. And so because um, the X plus is in FK and the ZI, ZI is in FK and uh, eta is in FK, we are very happy because this forces this add of X minus uh, of ZI to be in FK. Right, so oh, that's not the right letter. That should be a chi i, uh, which is chi i is defined as this element of fk times z uh, to the minus i, and z inverse is also in fk, so I get elements of fk. Right, so what do we do now? We just write on, uh, remember that x minus at this expression, and so we can rewrite what this means. And if you do that, uh, straightening some relations, you get that your chi i is equal to this expression there. And I will write that in matrix form. And if I write it in matrix form, this thing, it is telling you, you have a bunch of relations like this. So chi one is, uh, is given by, um, um, chi one is expressed in terms of this, uh, of this uh, vector here, and the coefficients are there, etc. At some point, uh, all the coefficients am are zero, so I will, uh, I will have a, a square finite matrix uh, expressing completely this, uh, this, uh, this uh, equations here. So why is it good? Because this matrix is actually um, a Van der Mond in disguise with different parameters. And so this is an invertible matrix. This is invertible. And so this means that you can express all the elements in this vector as linear combination of the chi i. But the chi i belong to fk, so all the vectors in that column will belong to fk as well. And so the sum of this element will belong to fk, and that's exactly my x minus element. So x minus is in fk, so x is in fk, and you can do that for all k which has no successor. And you're happy because we've just proven this. And there is one um, uh, non-trivial thing to prove is that this intersection is nothing but uh, algebra R. If you're familiar with quantum cluster algebra, it's not too surprising, I guess, because this is not far from saying that this algebra R is a quantum cluster algebra, which coincides with its upper quantum cluster algebra. So I'm not going to enter the detail of this because I'm running out of time, but it's it's Morally, it's, it's not too difficult to, to see that it should work. So how do we conclude? Well, we conclude by uh, saying that now we got our derivation D. Uh, its odd part is another X is an R. And what remains, we know, acts on the Ys in a certain way. So now you have to express uh, this derivation of delta, which is a derivation of R, that's it's a derivation of R. You know how it's acting on the Ys, and you need to uh, ex extract how it's acting on the, on the vector Es or X. Uh, there's a bit of technical work to do, but you can do that. And what you get in the end is the theorem I was mentioning earlier, that um, the derivation of UQ plus for G of the type uh, below are uh, all inner plus a sum uh, of uh, a linear combination of the decay over the center. And so you get that uh, uh, the uh, first cohomology group of this uh, algebra is uh, a free module of rank um, the number of, uh, of, of simple roots over the center of UQ plus. Okay, and I will basically keep this and just say thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, um, Stefan. Thank you very much <clears throat> for that very nice talk. Um, are there any questions from the audience?
Well, uh, if there are no questions, then let's thank Stefan one more time.